Well, good morning. I don't know if you caught what she said. She said, nobody's ever talked to me that way. And if you've seen that movie, you know in the scene before, he basically stands up for her and what she says. So, what she says. Anyway, so today we're continuing our... Oh, good morning. Today we're continuing our series, The Love Project. And I want to give you just a few tips. Uh, last week we talked about the best use of life is love. And here's the deal. If you've been a Christian any length of time at all, here's what happens to you and to me. You start out, I mean, there's two commands, okay? Jesus said, love God and love people. And you start out doing really well. You, you say, man, I really love God. And then you learn how to love people. But over time, what happens is you begin to make a list. And so on the days that you maybe spend time in the Bible or in the days that you do something good, you think, oh, I'm really good. God loves me more or however you think of that. And then on days where maybe you miss your quiet time or you yell at somebody in traffic or you're not nice to your kids, you think, oh, well, I'm just not a good Christian today. Not realizing that it's about God's grace. And here's what happens. If you're not careful because you do that with yourself, you will do that with other people. And so you'll go through life feeling like you're in competition with people. And instead of loving people, you will think selfishly. So, so here's one of the keys. I want to give you a little key every week, but here's one of the keys to love. Love isn't selfish. So it means that when you're being loving towards someone, you're not thinking of what they can do for you. You're not thinking of how they benefit you. You're not thinking of how they can get out of your way. You're thinking, how can I benefit them? And too often we do things that we think are loving when the truth is they're really self-serving. And so today we're going to give you some tips about this idea of loving with your words. And I'm going to give you some practical things. And so this morning or yesterday someone brought me a bit from a horse. And uh, uh, this is a very, this is a, a, a bit, we're going to talk about a verse that talks about this. But this is very small and it can tr control a horse that's thousands of pounds that can that can crush you in a moment. And uh, I actually found out this bit actually is for horses with anxiety. It actually has its own spinner. It's absolutely true. It has its own, what are those called? The little spinners the kids have? Fidget spinners. You all knew that and we all need sedatives now. Okay, but, but that, so this is the original fidget spinner for horses. This is for a horse with anxiety. It can actually spin this. I'm not gonna do it this morning, but it can actually spin this. Okay, but the truth is this little thing can steer a horse. Here's the deal. Your mouth, your words are making a huge impact every day. And it, it, listen, if you're under 30, if you can learn this, it will change your life. Because your words can impact your future. It can impact the people who even want to hang around you. Because the truth is, if your words are always negative or people won't want to be around you. If your words are always gossip, people won't want to be around you. If you are constantly putting others down, there will be a change in your life. But if you look to use your tongue to build others up, to not just go through life complaining and grumbling about everything that's wrong, or not finding fault in everybody around them. By the way, how many of you have ever made a mistake? Let's just raise our hands here. Okay, anybody who doesn't have their hands up, would you please tell them that they're making a mistake right now? Okay. <laughs> so we all have. So the truth is, when you look at people, you have a choice. You can talk about something that's wrong with them. Everybody has something, some more than others, wrong with them, right? And, and, but we have a choice of what we talk about. This bit can make a horse go a different way, but your tongue can impact your life. Now, years ago, we used to go to North Carolina. My sister Kelly is here this morning, and um, uh, she, she'll, you may know this girl's name. I can't remember. So we would go to my grandmother's house, and my dad or my uncle would uh, put us in. They, he had a lawnmower. This was so cool because, you know, in Miami, we didn't do this. But he had a lawnmower, and put, we'd put a trailer on it, and they'd go riding through the woods. And we'd ride around the farm there and everything, and we'd sing Life on the Farm. If I had my back. Anyway, and um, so there was a girl across the street. From grandma's house you remember her though right she was a few years older i was about eight and she was probably uh, uh 12 or 13 and she was cute so so one day she went on a ride with all of us and so i'm thinking you know you gotta how do you impress a girl you know i'm working on it so i looked over at her and i just started singing <laughs> 
you're going to sing, you might as well sing a Stevie Wonder song. So I looked at her and I went, My Sharia more pretty as a summer day. She said, Oh, you sing so good. <laughs> My Sharia more. Right? So, so, now let me tell you this. That's 40 years ago. 40 years is a long time. I know you guys don't know. That's 40 years ago, and I still remember it. And, and, and for years after that, I sang in choir, and I performed, and did stuff up front, and got offered a job on a cruise ship, and you don't know that story at all time. But, but all of these things, and I still remember that one word to me. Now, all of you, can remember something someone said to you that did the opposite of that. All of you can remember something somebody said to you that made you feel ugly, that made you feel worthless, that made you feel like you couldn't do anything, to, that made you feel like you couldn't measure up, that made you feel down. But here's the deal. In the middle of that, there were also people who shared words with you of what you could accomplish and what you could do and things that do matter. And here's the deal today. When we talk about words, you need to realize, you ready? You ready? Learn this young. Words are powerful. Don't discount what you say. You can use words to make people feel loved. You can use words to hate people. You can use words to encourage people, or you can use words to help them feel defeated. You, you can use words to show people that you love them. And to make them feel loved. And so today we're going to look at the book of James, or this verse, a few verses in the book of James, and then we're going to jump off of there and I'm going to give you some practical advice. But I love what James says because we totally, all of us, totally relate to this passage, especially the first sentence. So here it is, James chapter 3, and this is from the NIV version. Here's what it says. We all stumble in many ways. Some of you should just take that verse, that just that first sentence, and put it on your refrigerator. Because any time that you begin to look at other people and say, boy, look at them, they are totally messed up, James, the brother of Jesus, reminds us, by the way, Jesus had a brother, and Mary had more kids, but that's another story, all right? We all stumble. That word means to trip. To trip. We all trip. It's not that we purposefully go, I think I'll fall. I honestly, between you and me, I don't think anybody woke up one day and said, you know what? I want to be a crack addict today. <laughs> right? No, nobody, right? Nobody woke up and said, please give me some heroin. Let me shoot stuff into my arm. Right? Nobody woke up. What happened? They started with a little something, you know, whether it was a, a pot or maybe even smoking cigarettes. It might have started very simple. Just, just a little thing where they made just one little choice made another little choice, maybe it was something a little harder, or it was some opioid drugs, and they got a little addicted to something, and then the next thing, and what, what happens? And then one day they woke up and said, heroin will be good, and ruined their life. Listen, nobody says, I really hope that I can ruin my children's lives with the words that I say. I hope that when they get old, they remember how hurtful and mean I was. Man, I really hope I have no friends because people hate to be around me. Nobody says that. I mean, some people live it out, right? But you, did you know that neighbor, everybody has a neighbor. You know that neighbor that's mean and rude? They don't know they're mean and rude. They, they don't wake up in the morning and go, I am the meanest jerk there is. No, they just, to them it's normal. For some of you, these words, it's not that you're going through life going, I think I'll be mean to everybody. But you're so used to it that you just, you trip through life. And by the way, just fall forward. You know, as you go through life, you're going to stumble. And we all stumble in many ways. Not just in our words, but many ways. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. What if I stumble? What if I fall? All right. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say, and that word again is anyone who doesn't trip, on what they say is perfect. <clears throat> so he's saying no one is perfect. <laughs> just in case you're here going, I'll never say anything wrong. Okay. If you never say anything wrong... We don't like you. All right, so, um, 
And you don't talk enough, right? Right? So, and we know you're thinking stuff that you didn't say out loud. You mumbled it. All right. So able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. So he's talking about the positive. Man, your tongue just can impact your life. And then he continues... Uh, or take ships as an example. Although they're large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot wants to go, then he gets down to the real deal. James is looking and going, yeah, but we have this problem. Likewise, the tongue's a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. And in Florida, we know this well, right? We've had tons of rain, and all of a sudden, lightning hits a little area, and boom, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter how wet the ground is, the fire takes over. Hey, have you ever said something and made things worse? You can say the wrong things and make things worse. Hey, can I tell you a secret, though? You can say soothing things and put out the fire. The tongue is also a fire. I love this. Listen to this. A world of evil. <laughs> you, ever, you ever feel like, man, if I could just... Don't you wish you had a five-second delay? Like the TV, so like you said something, and then you're like, beep, right? <laughs> the tongue's of fire, world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire. Listen, itself is set on fire by hell. And this word for hell is this word for Gehenna. It's a, it's a place outside of Jerusalem. That was horrible. Whenever they passed by it, it, it brought shame on people who were Jewish. It was a, a terrible place. They, there was a time in Jewish history where they actually sacrificed their own children. They've actually done uh, archaeological excavations there not too long ago, and they found children's bones there that were burned. They sacrifice their children. And then, uh, because of, they just began burning trash out there, and the Romans actually came and started uh, burning criminals and stuff and throwing their bodies out there and would, would light them on fire. So the stench and the smell and the thought of what happened there, and James looks at us and says, you know that little thing in your mouth? When you say things that hurt other people and injure other people and attack other people and push them down and try to destroy other people with the things that you say, it's just like hell. And then he says, all kind of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are tamed and have been tamed by man, but nobody can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil. Do you know what I mean by restless? It means that, that when you're talking, you just, you're talking and you're saying nice things and you can instantly go from nice things to... Some of you on the way here were nice and you come to church and you're nice and you'll get in the car and some little thing will happen and your little restless tongue says things that you wish you hadn't said. Somebody pulls out in front of you and you say things you wish... You hadn't said. Somebody in our church has a, a, a four-year-old, and they were out of town, so they, the kids stayed with Grandma, Grandpa. Grandma and Grandpa were driving through town, stopped at a light, light turned green, the car in front waited just a second, and then went from the back seat. They heard, hey, it doesn't get any greener. <laughs> Wonder who they heard that from, right? A restless, restless evil, full of deadly poison, deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise the Lord and our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse humans who've been made in God's likeness. He's trying to remind us that everybody matters. Don't destroy people. So let's talk about why words matter. If you're under 30, this is really important for you to understand. Number one, our words set my direction. If you're always saying negative words, you will set a negative direction for your life. Some of you won't be able to get jobs or you'll lose jobs based on your negative words. Because you continually, you complain about the boss. You think the boss doesn't know. Let me tell you something. Your coworkers let your boss know what you say. You think that you have this secret conversation with someone. I can't believe the boss did that. That person is selling you out the next day. <laughs> don't think that it doesn't matter. Why? Why do you? Listen, you don't have to be negative. I know sometimes you feel negative. 
But by saying it, it doesn't help you to not feel negative. Actually, the more you say it, the more negative you feel. So don't keep saying negative things. You're pursuing. If you focus on the negative, guess what you're going to find? The negative. If you're an Xer in life, where you go through life looking for what's wrong, you will find it. Hey, and if you need a list on me, just ask me. I'll give it to you. I'll tell you all the things I irritate people about. It's easy. Next. My words can lead to my destruction. Now, in this, I get to tell you one of the things where I'm an idiot, okay? So, so I try to be vulnerable with you guys, so it gives you something to criticize me over just for fun. All right, so here's the deal. So occasionally I – occasionally. That might even be a lie. All right, so occasionally I drive over the speed limit on purpose. Okay, a few, few miles, a few miles over. So none of you ever do that, I know. We're not going to raise hands. But you just confess it to Jesus now, okay? And I don't have a sin enhancer in my car. You know, little things that tell you when the police is coming up, the sin enhancer. Some of you might call it a radar detector, sin enhancer, sin enhancer, all right? So because if I had one of those, my foot would never come off the gas, all right? So sometimes, you know, you know, I'll drive, you know, I'm driving 74, down on 95, and, you know, it's okay. Everybody's still passing me like I'm going three, right? And, and so, and, and, and that's the fastest I ever drive. Yeah, that's the ticket. Anyway, so I'm driving, right? So the other night I'm driving, and I'm not paying attention. I am not paying attention, which means I'm not paying attention, which means I'm probably singing or something. <laughs> Who knows what I'm doing? Not opera. I'm probably not singing opera. So I'm driving, and all of a sudden I see the reflective tape. Sheriff. And so I, oh, sheriff. And then I look at my speedometer, 72 miles an hour, 72. Huh, I'm going 72. At the same time I pass, 55. And then I, you know what happens next? <laughs> and I just kept driving. No, that's not what happened. The lights come on, and I think I should just pull over now. So, and I, of course, slow down as I'm driving, you know. And I get pulled over, and I pull over far off the grass. And, because I actually knocked on my passenger window, which freaked me out, you know, because I'm looking over here. And, Doo -doo -doo. <laughs> yes? May I get your order, sir? I, you know, I don't know what to do. So, you know, license and registration, the whole deal. He says, I assume you have insurance, which is good because I have no idea. That was probably in there, but probably buried under, you know, the receipts from Taco Bell. But anyway, so, so he goes back to his car. And, of course, I do what you do. Dear Jesus, I'm really sorry. <laughs> oh, wait, I forgot. So when he came up, he says to me, he says, uh, do you know how fast you were going? I said, well, I do because I looked, but I wasn't paying attention. I'm really sorry. I said, I was going 72. He said, no, you're going 74. Yes, sir, I was, going to, I was going whatever you said I was going, right? So he goes back to his car. Dear baby Jesus in heaven, Lord, I need your help, and uh, uh, I really don't need a $300 ticket. So he comes back and says, sir, I'm just going to give you a warning. I said, yes, sir, I love you. Can we no, I didn't say that. But I felt like saying it, like, can I kiss, can I give you a hug? Can I give you a hug? And, uh, uh, um, and so he goes back to his car, and I'm like, oh. So I put it in the top of my glove compartment, like, pay attention Brookins, when you're driving, that way when you see him ahead of time, you can slow down. No, I didn't say that. Just pay attention. Don't, you know, don't speak. Okay, so I thought about it, and we're talking about this whole idea of your words can lead to your destruction. What if when he came to the window, I put the window down just a little because I wanted to show him that he didn't have power over me. I put it down a little. I said, what do you want? So you know how fast you're going? You know what? I think you've just been sitting here trying to trap people all day long, and you cops just like to give people tickets. How many people think that would go well? Anybody in here think that would go? I think the drug dogs would have come out, right? They would have kept me. Pastors on the side of the road. Yes, thank you. Right? And you watch cops. You see it, right? You see people that if they just said, yes, sir, that they would go. But what do they do? They get, hey, what do you, who do you think you are? Point at a policeman, and then what happens? All of a sudden, your hand's behind your back and has cuffs on it, right? Your words... Can lead to your destruction now hopefully you're smart enough that you don't do that with somebody in authority right but do you destroy people who you think you have power over do you destroy people when they can't give you a ticket because you can if you do it's about you it's selfishness and you can destroy your life and you can destroy your legacy Based on what you say. Number three, though, my words put my heart or my thoughts on display. You ever say something and you think, why did I say that? If you guys need to answer that, it's okay. Or 
Or you can mute it, which would be better. But if it's God, please answer. He may have something to share. So. <laughs> oh, yes, Lord, I'll tell him. Yes. Eric, tell them that story. You know, I don't know. All right. So here's the deal. You ever say, oh, I just said that because I was tired? Well, that's true. But that's because you turned the filter off. It's not because it wasn't in your heart. So when you find yourself saying something, don't excuse it. Admit it. That was in my heart. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's the next thing. And so why we need the Holy Spirit to produce love in our heart. The Holy Spirit helps us to produce love. Why? Because love isn't natural for humans. We are selfish and self-centered. Even when we do loving things, we can do them for selfish reasons, if not for God's power. And that's why we need God's power. Not to try to impress people, not to try to do, but to do it because God has poured his love into us. Here's what Jesus said. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Time out. So what do people pick off of you? When people pick fruit from the things you say, what do they taste? And then Jesus looks at the religious leaders and says, you brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? By the way, most of the time when Jesus talked about hell, he wasn't talking to unbelievers. He was talking to religious leaders who thought that they were better than everybody else. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. This is why it's important to spend time in God's word. This is why it's important to spend time in the Bible. This is why it's important to spend time in prayer, spend time in God's presence. Why? So that through the Holy Spirit, he can pour his love into you so that the things that flow out of you are from him, not from your own selfishness, self-centeredness, pride, arrogance, all of those things. So Jesus is with his disciples and they didn't wash cups the way they should have. And the Pharisees were freaking out, and they started talking about the cups, and here's what Jesus said to them. He said, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. And here's what Jesus was saying to them. He wasn't saying, don't wash your hands, okay? Don't, don't think, think that. But what Jesus was saying is, you're so worried about a cup, and you're not worried about the person who's drinking out of the cup. You ever do the right thing for the wrong reason and with the wrong attitude? Let me give you an example. Start washing dishes in the kitchen sink. You kids don't clean up around here. I just did it, right? <laughs> Hello? What's more important? The dish or the kids? Now, I'm not saying your kids don't need to learn to clean up. But it's funny how we do things for our children that the truth is we're doing them for ourselves. And you can tell by well, the things that you say and are the things that flow out of your mouth. And we're going to do boundaries next month and or, uh, uh, in about a month and a half. And as we start with boundaries, I'm going to talk about, you know, how do we help people to do the things we want to do without being manipulative, without being controlling? How do we help discipline our children with the right boundaries? It's not just religious rules. The Pharisees were all about who they hung out with and what they did and their list of rules. And in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul makes it very clear. He says, hey, without love, you can do all the right things. But it's nothing. It doesn't matter. So you have to do it with love. So let's look at, from Ephesians chapter 4, three types of loving words. Number one, love people with honest words. Hooked on phonics. <laughs> love people with honest words, okay? Love people with honest words. And I love this verse, and most Christians don't have this down. Speaking the truth in love. And actually it says, speaking the truth in love, when all things grow up into him and his head is Christ. So, it, it, but it's the idea of speaking the truth in love. So let me show you both sides. There's truth and there's love. And this is where we miss it. You ready? We either go over here to the truth side and we say, well, I was just telling them the truth. I'm the person who's known for my word. The rude people that you know, that's what they'll say. Well, I just speak my mind. Well, we don't like what's in your mind. All right? I just say the truth. Listen, you can say the truth and be wrong. Why? Because we're supposed to speak the truth in love. Now, here's the problem. Some people think, well, I don't want to speak the truth. I'll hurt their feelings. Well, but you can't just say, I think you're great. I think, listen, 
It's not just love. If you only tell your children what they do right, you are doing them a disservice. If you only talk about, I only love, if you never have any correction, you're out of balance. You still need to speak the truth. But you have to do it in the right way, the right time. Speak it in love. Proverbs 27, 5 says it this way. It's better to correct someone openly than to love and not show it. Better to correct someone openly than to have love and not show it. So if you love people, talk about how you love them, but tell them the truth. Love does not delight in evil, 1 Corinthians said, but rejoices with the truth. This is the idea. Listen, love is not being spoken to manipulate somebody. A car salesman speaks loving words in order to manipulate you. A realtor tells you this is a great neighborhood at every house. How can every neighborhood be great? Right? People can speak the truth, but do it to manipulate you. And so this verse says, love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And the idea is, don't just say words to try to get people to do what you want. There are people that will say all the right things, but they're doing it to get something out of you. They look at people like chess pieces and they, they say, how can I get that person to do what I want them to do? I will say these words. And we all know someone like that. And if you don't know somebody like that, it's just because you're oblivious to it. Don't try to de de deceive people. Don't try to manipulate them, but speak words, the truth in love. Number two, love people with careful words. When I taught school, I learned this lesson about how we say and what we say. I used to eat in the lunchroom with this group of people. I was very young. I think I was 21 when I first started teaching. And so I'm in the lunchroom with these people. 21's young, but I was young. All right. So, I, so I'm in the lunchroom with these, these, uh, these uh, different teachers, and they would complain about the kids. I mean, there were kids that I didn't even know that I would see walking across campus, and I would say, that's a doofy kid. I never even talked to that student. But because of these words that I was hearing, not carefully spoken, I was, you know, they would complain about the principal. They would complain about the school. And I found myself teaching, and all day just, mm, that is what a terrible school this is. And one day, I interrupted one of the people speaking, not on purpose, but a little ADD moment, right? That never happens. And it's never happened to you. And, and I interrupt myself. So, so, and one of the teeth, and the lady looked at me and she goes, you interrupt all the time. I'm sick of that. I said, okay. So I didn't eat in there anymore. I said, well, fine. Let them talk to themselves. That's fine. So I just started, I figured I'd better eat by myself. So I started eating by myself and another group of teachers came and said, hey, are you eating by yourself? Come eat with us. So I went in with them and they talked about sports and then they started talking about, hey, this kid needs this help. Well, that's the same kid the other guy was saying as a jerk. This kid really needs, he's having a hard time. And then they talked about the principal. How do you think we can help the principal? What can we do? Did you know the whole school changed? Now, here's what's wild. Let me tell you what came out of that. So instead of teaching and going, I got a bunch of bad kids. By the way, I had the worst kids. I'll tell you how I know that. Because I started a few weeks after school started, and the teachers got to choose who came to my class. So they said, ah, you can have this one and this one and this one. So my class was full of kids that other teachers didn't want. So I began teaching those kids. By the way, just to tell you how bad this school was, one day the security guard, weaponized security guard, came and weighed crack cocaine in my science classroom to see if it was a felony or a misdemeanor. During class. I'm having class. So anyway, I'm teaching these kids, and suddenly I have a different perspective. Why? Because careful words were being spoken around me. Caring words, loving words were being spoken. And I began looking at these kids' paper, and there were a couple of kids that were disruptions during class. And I began looking at how they took notes, and all three of them never separated the words when they took notes. I started looking at their paper, and I realized they couldn't read what they were writing. They were just writing it. And didn't know where the words separated because they didn't know how to read. So 
So I went to the reading specialist and three kids that year at 15 and 16 years of age, they were older, they were still in junior high, learned how to read that year for the first time. Why? Because I began seeing things differently, because I began saying things differently, and it changed my whole perspective. And this day, there are three kids who are probably in their mid-30s now who know how to read because of a change, just a little change. That's how words make a difference. So pay attention to your words and pay attention to the words you listen to. It makes a huge difference day after day. Listen to Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Wouldn't it be great if you could just live that out? Don't you say amazingly dumb things when you're mad? You ever see somebody get so mad that they made you laugh at them? I was spanked for that, by the way, okay? <laughs> Which is also anger. So, and then it says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. And I've had people say to me, but Eric, you don't understand, something was said to me and I couldn't make it right. No, no, it's not even saying not to make it right. It says, don't let the sun go down while you're angry. What does that mean? You have to let the anger go. So whatever happened, you have to take to the Lord before you go to bed and say, Lord, you know this happened and it made me feel, by the way, anger is a secondary emotion. So it means you're mad about something else. So God, this person disrespected me, or this person was mean to me, or this person made me feel like I didn't matter, or, or whatever happened that made you angry, you say, Lord, I give that to you, and you leave it with him. Why? So that the next morning you don't wake up, and you start right where you left off, and you attack everybody around you as you walk in anger. We all know those people. Let go of those angry thoughts. Proverbs 16, 28 is probably the hardest thing for churches. And this is where most people don't like church. It says this, a gossip separates close friends. Listen, just like in that classroom, you can be upset at somebody you've never met or talked to or given a chance to defend themselves. Gossip is when you talk about somebody selfishly. Gossip is when you talk about somebody and you are not part of the problem or the solution. Gossip is when you do a prayer request in front of a group of people so that they can know what somebody did to you. I just want you to pray for our pastor. This week, you should have seen him. I, he drove right past me on I-95. He must have been going 140 miles an hour. I think we all just need to go lay hands on his car. Right? Or I just want us to pray for Sally. Yesterday, you should have heard what she said to me, right? And the truth is, we're not praying for somebody. We're gossiping about somebody, and we use Jesus to justify our gossip. That is garbage. Now, let me give you a Captain Obvious statement, okay? You know what Captain Obvious is already? He's got a lot of commercials. He tells you things you already knew. So I'm going to tell you something you know, but I bet you forgot. So when you're sitting with a group of people and they start gossiping, you ready? Or even online. You read a comment online and you, get to get, you can get in on it if you want. You don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to reply. I'm with you. They're an idiot. Because here's what happens when we get in a group. What we do is to make ourselves feel better. We think we have to push other people down because we don't understand grace. We've been given grace. You don't deserve God's love. And neither do they. And neither do you. And we all stumble in many ways. Did you figure that part out? And so what's the deal? Hey, I'm as broken as they are. Why am I going to participate in their destruction? And let me tell you something about people gossiping. As soon as you get up to go to the bathroom, you're the subject. And don't think that's not true. James 3.18, you guys like that one. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Wouldn't it be great if everywhere you went, people said, you know, they made me feel peaceful. Haven't you ever walked into somebody's house and you felt peace? Did you know you can pray peace over a home? The Bible says that when you enter somebody's home, you pray that God's peace rests on it. So there's something about that word of God's peace. But haven't you ever walked into a home that had no peace? Peacemakers don't live there. You can be a peacemaker. You can be the person that wherever you go, you bring discord or peace. What's the harvest you want? There are people who can speak one word and settle everybody down. Sometimes it's not just what they say, it's how they say it. The broken family tends to be pretty loud, right Kelly? Are we tend to be 
Why? Because we were all fighting for food. Whoever was loudest got food. The other people starved. It was bad. So we tend to be a little loud. We have this loud voice. But it's amazing how even me with this loud voice, somebody can come up to me and go, Pastor Eric. And I go, yeah. <laughs> Number three, love people with edifying words. Now there is a horribly mean game called Bean Boozled. Anybody in here ever heard of Bean Boozled? Okay, I'm going to tell you what it is. <laughs> I heard yuck. That was awesome. Okay. So Bean Boozled is a jelly bean game where you kind of choose, basically you choose random jelly beans and some of them taste like poo. Okay? There's poop jelly beans. Okay? It's just, <laughs> right? So, so here's the evil part. My son has this game. My mom was over... And she says, I don't know who had those jelly beans, but they're disgusting. Because she went in the kitchen and... Poop jelly bean, right? So here's the deal. What's coming out of your mouth? This word in the Greek for unwholesome is like this word dirty or filthy or poop. All right? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to your needs, according to their needs. You know how you can tell if you're speaking the right words, if what you're saying is really to help them. By the way, there's a lot of church discipline that goes on that we think really is to help the other. We pretend it's to help the other person, but the truth is it's for us to have control. If you really care about others, your goal is not to control someone or to keep them in line. It's to help them. How can I build them up? How can I make them stronger? How can I say things to them that are going to make them stronger? So here's a few Proverbs real quick. Here's how to harvest words of love. Kind words. Kind words transform worry to joy. Worry is a heavy load, but a kind word cheers you up. Did you know they've done studies that just saying to somebody, it's going to be okay, lowers their blood pressure? So I want you to take a moment. Let's lower everybody's blood pressure. Tell everybody around you it's going to be okay. Go ahead. It's going to be okay, right? Now here's the thing. Even if in your brain you think it's not going to be okay, but you look at the person you say it's going to be okay, they go, okay. Now, it doesn't mean that, but there's something about that that makes a big difference. Number two, gentle words break through anger. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You ever stir up anger with a harsh word? You doofus. Does that help? <laughs> but a gentle answer, hey, you ready for a key? If you have a loud family, lower the volume. If you walk into a home and everybody's fighting, just, you bring it down. If somebody gets mad at you and gets angry at you, you say, I don't understand why you do this. You go... Well, actually, right, slow down. And some of you need to slow down just so you don't say something ridiculous. Pleasant words encourage learning. Proverbs 16, 21, pleasant words promote instruction. <clears throat> 1996, a girl had a broken foot. <clears throat> She's a gymnast. Bella looks at her and he says, you can do it. That's all he said, like three times. You can do it. She went and won the gold medal. You can do it. I mean, that's what a big deal pleasant words are. Honest words make us feel loved. An honest answer, it says, is like a kiss on the lips. When's the last time you told somebody you appreciated them? When's the last time you said to somebody, thanks for what you do? Hey, there'll be a day you can't tell them that anymore. That kid who's driving you crazy... That person in your family, it's their turn to call you. Let's quit that mess. Speak honest, loving words. Wise words heal broken hearts. We all need wisdom. That's why we need good counselors. Careless words stab like a sword. We've all done that, right? But wise words bring healing. Listen, words are powerful. You're leaving a wake. You're leaving a taste in people's mouth from the fruit that you're bringing. What taste will people have from your life? You can love or you can hate. You can encourage or you can defeat. And I want to encourage you to speak words of love. But the first way to speak words of love is to receive God's love. It's hard to be loving until you receive his love because you tend to be selfish. 
So if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, maybe you know about him, maybe you've studied him, maybe you know about his life, but you've never said, Jesus, I want to put you first in my life. I know you died for my sins and I want to give you my life. You said in the Bible, it says that whoever believes in him won't perish, but have eternal life. And it's the idea that when you give your life to Christ, when you trust him, he gives you eternity. And what happens is when you say, Jesus, I trust you, the Bible says he fills you with his Holy Spirit, which gives you the ability to love. You may be here as a Christian, and as I said some of these things, you kind of went, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You did the Lucille Ball face, right? And you realize, I'm not good at that. Hey, ask God to begin to fill you with his love. Maybe there was somebody that came to mind. Like, you do well with everybody except that one person, right? Say, God, would you give me the love that I need for that person? Would you pour into my life so that the words I say would be loving even towards them? He can do it. My prayer is that as we leave here and we go different places, that everywhere you go, that people would pick fruit from you that would make their life better, that would build them up, that they would say, what do you know that I don't know? That they would say, you've got love that I don't have. When they gossip and they curse and they say mean things about other people, that they would get around you and go, you know, you're not like everybody else. And they sense God's love because of the fruit of your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, for this message about words. It's so easy to be careless, Lord. Father, it's so easy to to not pay attention to what we say and to hurt the people around us. But Lord, just like a bit in our mouth, I pray that your Holy Spirit would make us sensitive to the things that we're saying and the way we're making others feel and the taste that we leave everywhere we go. We pray that it would be the taste of your love everywhere we go, that the things that we speak or say would be from your love. Father, I just ask today, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have our time of giving now. You give what God's put on your heart. Listen, after you give, or as you're giving.